Hello and welcome to Security Scan. I am Uday Bhaskar. This week, the focus is on Syria and the intractable political and security developments in that part of the world, which, alas, have turned into a colossal human tragedy. Regrettably, this issue has not received the kind of attention it warrants. And even as we speak, the Syrian quagmire, as it were, remains a contested issue between the major powers at the global level, among the regional stakeholders who are numerous and pursue contradictory objectives, and the besieged Assad regime, which is unable to obtain the internal support and cohesion it seeks. The Syrian war began in early 2011, and five years later, almost 300,000 people have been killed, though the estimates vary, and more than 11 million people have been displaced. Chemical weapons have been used, and a United Nations Inquiry Commission concluded that all the parties to the conflict were guilty of war crimes. This is very grave indictment, but it has had little effect. Currently, there is a stalemate in the UN Security Council over Syria and, by extension, the Islamic State. Who is supporting whom? Who is pursuing what? And what is the relevance for India? To discuss this, as always, we have an eminent panel. Ambassador Fabian, who was our ambassador in Qatar and has also served as Joint Secretary Gulf in the MEA. Monish Gulati of the Society for Policy Studies, who has been watching West Asia. And Siddharth Vardarajan, editor of The Wire, a very noted foreign policy commentator, amongst other things. Ambassador Fabian, if I could begin with you. You know, we are talking about current developments in Syria. What exactly are the current developments, if you could summarize them for us? Well, let me put it this way. You started by saying that major powers uh, have differences over Syria. But uh, from my way of looking, the major powers, especially Russia and the United States, are following a set of policies calculated to kill more and more Syrians and to no useful purpose. There was a ceasefire which was uh, uh, announced uh, on the 9th of September uh, between John Kerry, the Secretary of State, US, and uh, his uh, Russian counterpart, uh, Lavrov, with much fanfare. But then what happened? And this took about 10 months of negotiation, tortuous negotiations. Well, the ceasefire was not honored. On the 17th of September, uh, the US-led coalition bombed and killed Syrian troops. Initial figure of the toll was 62. Later, it was said it was more than 80. And the Syrian troops are being supported by Russia. Syrian troops are supported by Russia, and there was some exchange between Russia and the United States, the militaries that, you know, United States said they were going to have an operation in that part of Syria and all that. Of course, the United States said it was a mistake, and uh, reluctantly they expressed regret, but uh, I do not think that... Uh, uh, it was such Syrian, a mistake. Syrian President Assad or President Putin accepts it as a mistake, and probably it was not a mistake. Then on the 19th, a convoy of trucks, 31 of them, uh, you know, stationed uh, in the rebel-held area in eastern uh, in Aleppo province, uh, 18 trucks were destroyed, and about 20 medical workers were killed. Again, there is a controversy about as to who did it. The United Nations has determined that there was an aerial attack. If so, who did it? Well, the Russians are saying, and the Syrians are saying, uh, Americans were responsible. But it's very difficult to believe that the Americans Indus. would have done it. After all, why should they do it? And the Americans are saying that the Russians did it. So basically, the whole picture is very murky. 
Absolutely. But Monish, if I can bring you in on this, can you help us to understand the military part in the sense, what is the current, <clears throat> shall we say, balance of forces if there is a balance and is it binary, <coughs> meaning the pro-Assad and the anti-Assad or are they multiple military players in the Syrian war? <coughs> so, there are multiple military players. And uh, what has happened in the last few weeks is we find that the level of armaments and the threshold has increased. Now, Russia maintains a permanent maritime military mission in the Mediterranean Sea. The last few days, we've seen that they have brought back two guided missile destroyers there and another air defense ship. Now, these guided missile destroyers are capable of firing cruise missiles. In addition to that, about a couple of months back, they had deployed the S-400 air defense missile systems. Now, in the last couple of weeks again, we find that they have brought the S-300 also to be deployed in conjunction with the S-400. Now, these are serious uh, air defense missile systems in the sense that not only do they defend an airspace, they are capable of denying an airspace. Now, this is being seen by analysts as a move to cut out any move by the Western allies. The US led. The US led Western allies in support of the Syrian Sunni forces to uh, establish a no-fly zone, which R Russia has recently vetoed. So they are bringing in armaments to make sure that this kind of situation does not take place and it takes away that option from the Western allies. On the other hand, you find that Turkey taking advantage of what was happening between Russia and the coup attempt supposedly supported by USA. They have moved in into the Syrian territory around Jarablus and they have occupied about 100 square kilometers. And they also have unveiled certain ballistic missiles which they have uh, in a kind of a threatening in a way. So with these things, the level of armaments have gone up and uh, we can expect uh, in case there are more uh, incidents of uh, attack and all, uh, you will find that the number of casualties will go up. Are likely to go up. Siddharth, how would you pull this together in terms of the foreign policy objectives of the principal players? We are aware of the Assad regime itself and the kind of pressure being applied on them. But Washington, Moscow, and he spoke about Turkey, Iran, Saudi. So who is doing what? Well, I think to, <coughs> to understand that, one has to perhaps go back five or six years to um, the change which occurred in the wake of Arab Spring. Because prior to that, it's not as if Syrian relations with Saudi Arabia, which is, we haven't spoken about Riyadh yet, but they're a primary driver in the region as far as the uh, civil war is concerned. Uh, you know, relations were fairly decent. Uh, and the two had even managed to reach a certain amount, certain kind of modus vivendi. Um, you know. But I think following the uh, Arab Spring, following the collapse of the um, Mubarak regime in uh, Egypt. Egypt and generally Saudi anxieties about how the new emerging order might look. I think they uh, used this opportunity to try to topple uh, Syria, uh, of course, to get the uh, Assad regime out, but also because they saw the Syrians as a proxy or as an ally of the Iranians. Uh, who so there is a Saudi-Iran dimension. So there is a, there is a Saudi-Iran dimension. The, uh, there's little love lost between the Israelis and the Assad regime. The U.S., um, I think, has been at least initially a somewhat reluctant recruit, but is also now committed, uh, even if it um, doesn't know in military terms how exactly to go about uh, bringing about the, the desired change. For the U.S., would you say the Islamic State is the driver? I would say the U.S. is still driven by wanting to get rid of the Assad regime. I would say that is still the primary motivation. Uh, the Islamic State, if the Islamic State were the primary target for the US, I don't think we would see the kind of ambiguity that we're seeing. I don't think we would have seen the kind of differences of opinion between Russia and, and the US that we're seeing. And the US is not, this is not the first time the US has done this, right? Where in the face of uh, grievous threats by, uh, you know, ideological forces that are actually, you know, inimical to the US, whether you speak of the uh, post-Afghan uh, uh, war, you know, the Soviet invasion, the kind of jihadi groups that emerged out of it, Osama bin Laden himself, uh, and uh, now ISIS. Uh, the U.S., of course, sees ISIS as a threat, as an enemy, but 
uh, I wonder if they see ISIS as a, a bigger threat than the Assad mm -hmm. regime. So I think that it's all of these dynamics that are playing out, uh, and then you have uh, Russian and U.S. rivalry, U.S. anxieties about what uh, Russia is going to do. Russia, in a way, having battered on the back foot in the face of Western pressure over uh, uh, the Ukraine, Ukraine, now has has a broader canvas to play on. So I think these are all working uh, to complicate uh, and a horrible there's situation. And no clarity about the and, objective. And, and I would say Turkey uh, is also an, an important player here. Uh, the Turkish relationship with ISIS has been ambivalent. Uh, Turkey has paid the price as a result of it because ISIS now has begun to target uh, places inside uh, Turkey. And now the Turks uh, are, um, you know, having uh, shot down a Russian plane, trying to mend their fences with Moscow. Even as Which they seem to have done, you know, well, Turkey uh, to an the, extent. The, you know. the, the, the two yes. leaders met yeah. and things seem to be normal. But I think a, 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 a propellant of that is also the fact that uh, Turkey-U.S. relations today, particularly with the demand that the Turkish president has made that uh, Mr. Gulen, Gulen be, be, be handed over to, to, uh, yeah. to the Turks to face justice for the attempted coup, U.S. is not going to do that. So I think this is all... Uh, increasing the toxicity of the mix. And also, I think the level of the entanglement in terms of players. But Ambassador Fabian, in all of this, you know, what is the relevance for India? Meaning we have spoken about so many dimensions as far as Syria, ISIS, Iraq are concerned. Siddharth referred to the Shia-Sunni dynamic. Now, West Asia has always been of considerable importance to India for a variety of reasons. But looking at Syria, and by extension, IS all the way to Iraq and the Iran-Saudi contestation. How would you characterize the Indian, the relevance for India? Well, first of all, India has consistently taken the position that there should be no regime change by force, by external intervention, because if you try to do that, whether you succeed or not, there will be a terrible mess accompanied by a humanitarian, uh, what shall, shall we say, crisis. So that, I think, what India's position has been, unfortunately, confirmed by... The crisis has become a tragedy. Yes. Now, second thing is that uh, as regards uh, what is happening in Syria, it is those who are militarily intervening in Syria who have got together, you know, the... International Syria Support Group. Uh, they have been sort of uh, meeting together and coming out with uh, uh, proposals. And uh, but obviously India cannot be part of that because India is not militarily involved in Syria. India has no intention of getting involved. So that way India cannot be a major player in uh, bringing about a ceasefire to be followed by a political process. But at the same time, I would say that uh, India has uh, uh, maintained relations with uh, the Syrian government because we have an ambassador there. Not many countries mm -hmm. have embassies there. And we have an ambassador there. And uh, our Minister of State, uh, Mr. Akbar, Akbar was there recently. Gone there. So we are keeping in touch. And, uh, and we had also provided some aid worth almost a million dollars, I think, as far as Syria's. But let me just move to you, Monish. You spoke about the air defense missiles. Now, the extended point is, I think all our panelists, Siddhartha and Ambassador Fabian, have spoken about Russia and US. The whole embedded WMD, you know, weapons of mass destruction, both the missiles, as also the nuclear weapon inventory as far as the US and Russia are concerned. I'm not suggesting that they are coming into Syria. But at the global level, you know, you can see that between the United States and Russia, the tension is palpable. So what is your interpretation? Because chemical weapons have already been used as far as Syria is concerned. So this entire sort of uh, macro military capability, how is that being brought into the grid? I'll take off from where uh, Siddharth had made a mention that whatever is happening in Syria doesn't find all the reasons don't find the root in Syria. There are certain other go, uh, global tensions and uh, issues which are now projecting themselves in the US-Russian rivalry in Syria. Firstly is the NATO movement eastwards. And because of that, you find that uh, in the Baltic region, 
in Crimea, you find that the Russians are more aggressive. And the second point that you made about the WMD, that is, uh, uh, you would be referring to the recent uh, uh, Russian move to do away with the agreement on plutonium. Plutonium, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, this was the agreement on management and disposition of the plutonium. Which was post-Cold War. Which was, uh, uh, which came into shape somewhere around 2000. It was uh, negotiated around 2007. It was renegotiated around 2010. And it was still in the process of being renegotiated when Putin recently, last couple of weeks back, when he decided to do away with the yeah. agreement. So it was not an operational agreement. But the way I see it is, uh, it is something to do with what is happening in the US is that very soon we're going to have a new president. And the new president is likely to be more hawkish. So what Putin is doing in, say, in uh, the Baltic region or in Syria is he is collecting bargaining chips. Now, by doing away with this agreement, this is just an agreement. They were talking. They can start talking again. So when the next president comes, he's going to use these chips to improve his position and get a better deal for Russia and probably uh, do away with the sanctions and ease more pr uh, pressure that is coming on Russia because of the <coughs> sanctions and the fall in the oil prices. Siddharth, would you go along with that? And I also want you to briefly touch upon BRICS. The summit is now coming up in Goa. Would Syria find significant mention as far as the BRICS summit, considering that Russia, India and China, apart from Brazil, South Africa, of course, are going to be meeting there without the US being a member of this yeah. group? Well, the Russian interest will be to obviously push BRICS to endorse, endorse the uh, Russian position to the greatest extent possible. If you look at the uh, conflict between the two resolutions in the UN Security Council Security last Council. week, it's clear that the Chinese are quite happy to be with the Russians on this. And, uh, you know, the fact that India strongly believes in the importance of regime change being taken off the table and that there should be uh, a ceasefire. And India also agrees with Russia about the primary threat posed by ISIS. And along with ISIS, groups like Jabhat al-Nusra and a lot of the Salafi groups that the Saudis have, have backed without any clear delineation between uh, those that the U.S. labels terrorist and those which do not have their designation but which freely share their material and, and money and weapons and so on. So I think there's a lot of similarity between the Indian and the Russian uh, and the Chinese position. I would say that the uh, Brazilians and uh, South, South Africans uh, are an un un uncertain quantity, particularly Brazil now with President Temer. I think earlier with Dilma Rousseff, things might have been a bit different. But uh, Temer, Temer's entry was strongly backed by the United States. So I would imagine that that foreign policy or strategic coherence which we saw earlier in BRICS, or, or which has been evolving in a certain direction, I suspect will not uh, go much Emergency further uh, uh, at the Goa summit. Uh, so, and, and in any case, BRICS as BRICS remains a marginal player for very obvious reasons. As far as the U.S.-Russian... I mean, that old adage saying that you have the BRICS, but where's the mortar? Yeah, uh, exactly. Well, going but I, think, I think BRICS has proved itself in other, uh, uh, you know, in, in, under other heads. Uh, but as far as this issue is concerned, I don't see too much prospect of uh, the grouping really taking an initiative on the Syria. Because, you know, Syria is essentially, it's a military question. And unless the principal protagonists or the, the proxy powers which are the, the, the Saudis, the Qataris, um, the US, France, Britain, Turkey, Russia, unless they reach an understanding, which they don't seem likely to, uh, I, you know, it, it seems very difficult for what... Any thoughts on WMD, what Monish was saying? You know? No, see, the thing is that uh, I agree with Monish that, th that this is, uh, you know, there has been, uh, shall we say, an upending of earlier agreements, even in the past. The manner in which the US pushed missile defense, for example, led to, or abrogation of INF Treaty, you know, so there's been a complicating factor for a while. And uh, the plutonium agreement, the fact is that A, it was not operational. B, even if it were to be operational, the uh, number of nuclear weapons that would eventually go known. off the table, it would still leave Russia and the US with so enough to destroy the world many times So perhaps it be fair to say over. that it's more symbolic than substantive, but it does give an indication no, it's an about... It's, it's an indication of the fact WMB that, the, that, that the... Well, I would say of US, the trajectory of us russia relations, mm. which... You know, despite that that uh, heartening moment where Lavrov and and Kerry said that we reached yeah, an agreement, yeah. and things as really, Mr. Fabian uh, said, as, as Mr. Fabian was saying, things okay. are really looking up. That but whole thing has gone south. Mr. Fabian, let me come back to you. You know, this is a rather grim and pessimistic kind of conclusion about the way ahead. Now that there is this very very sharp difference of opinion within the United Nations Security Council, 
where do we go from here? I mean, people are dying. We spoke about 300 to 400,000 people dying, 11 million displaced, winter is coming. So, you know, is there any glimmer of the way ahead? I think we have to ask ourselves two questions. One is what is going to happen between now and when, when uh, the new president of the United States comes in. Uh, there is considerable pressure, increasing pressure on President Obama to be, have a more assertive military policy in Syria. As you know, 51 diplomats, the United States uh, has a dissent channel, you know, a channel of dissent. So they came out with a statement saying that the current policy of the, president, of, uh, the Obama administration is wrong. They want a more assertive military policy. Secondly, on the 6th of December, there was a principals committee, that is, uh, secretaries of defense and uh, state, uh, the joint chiefs of staff, and uh, the White House uh, top aides, uh, and the CIA. They met, and they were discussing uh, plans. And there was even a discussion, not a decision, of uh, using the Air Force against uh, Syria, that is, against Assad. Now, I don't think Obama will agree to it, but he might. He might agree to giving uh, more weapons, say, manpads, you know, yeah. to the rebels, the so-called moderate rebels, so that Russian planes or Syrian planes can be brought down. So that might happen. But as to what uh, Hillary Clinton might do, we do Remains not know. But mark. please remember that uh, she had uh, proposed a, a no-fly zone some time back. And she has also said that the Kurds should be armed in a big way, which, of course, the United States is doing in a way, but not in a big way. Monisha, brief question. Aleppo, you know, whatever is happening over there, would that be significant if there is a kind of decision, a military kind of decision over Aleppo or not quite? So the earlier position we had was <clears throat> that the Russians were trying to find a way around Assad while he was trying to hold on to his territory. Now the situation is that the Syrian Sunnis are trying to find a way to reconcile themselves on accepting Assad at the same time while they are trying to hold on to their territory. And the Russian position now has become that they are either they reconcile to Assad or they are going to be knocked off the negotiating table. So the Aleppo, Aleppo is in that direction. They are going to push out these people from Aleppo and probably push them right across the Turkish border. And once they are out of the uh, Syrian uh, territory, th their negotiating uh, stand becomes very, very, weak. very different. Siddharth, the last question, and it's neither trick nor Twitter, but how long do you think President Assad would be able to continue in office? You know, he was, short written, <laughs> he was written off um, four years ago, he was written off two years ago, even last year he was written off. The Russian military assistance came like a shot in the arm. But even in the absence of the uh, Russian assistance, the fact that the government has held on tells us that there is uh, uh, there are important pockets of support that the and government And there is enjoys. resilience and he and, might... And I would say that whatever the world may think of the Assad regime, and you know, obviously uh, the views are largely uncharitable, please ponder over the consequences of regime change in places like Iraq and Libya. Yeah. Another state where you That's destroy right. the government uh, will uh, just unfold in a disastrous manner. The current political dynamic about Syria is about war crimes, as we see in the United Nations Security Council and elsewhere. But the question remains, who will be prosecuted by the ICC, the International Criminal Court, if at all? However, the enormity of what has unfolded in Syria and contiguous parts of West Asia is also a reflection of the poverty of the global community where the exercise of macro-military power has not been filtered through political perspicacity and a fidelity to ethics and international law. In many ways, the Guardian has turned predator. Can India and like-minded nations outside of the United Nations Security Council do anything? Perhaps to mitigate the human suffering in a small way? India has made a modest contribution of about a million dollars, hopefully, to provide succor to the hapless women and children who are trapped in a war zone that is not of their making. Could more such help be provided? It would be symbolic 
but also a reflection that the humanist impulse has not been totally erased in the post 9-11 global turmoil. On that note, let me thank my guests, Ambassador Fabian, Monish and Siddharth Vardarajan. And thanks to all of you for watching Security Scan. Goodbye.